Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Our guest today is Duncan Wardle. He is the former VP of Innovation and Creativity at the Walt Disney Company, and he is now the founder of ID8 with the number eight and Innovate with the number eight. And he's an innovation and creativity consultant and keynote speaker. Duncan, I'm thrilled to have you on the podcast today. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. So I, I've been dying to ask you this question. Your 30 years of work at the world's most premier storytelling company, um, leads me to be really excited to ask you, what role do you think storytelling plays in the art of innovation? Everything. So it doesn't, look, cavemen, right? So cavemen couldn't speak, by the way. So they didn't, you know, one caveman couldn't go up to the next one and say, hey, Fred, there's a dinosaur coming. Um, (laughs) So they actually (laughs) spoke through intuition. They actually spoke through intuition. But after they could speak, we all got around the campfire. And so here, it's not just the ability to tell a story. It's the ability to find a core consumer truth. And I'll focus in on both, for, if I may. When you were a little kid, so when I grew up, I grew up in the 60s, cowboys were heroes. David Crockett, the Lone Ranger. We all walked with the funny John Wayne Gate. We yeah. had the sheriff's badge. Those were the days. Right? And then some <laughs> dude called Neil Armstrong came down the steps, said one small step, step for man, and here's the death of the cowboys. And suddenly, overnight, None of us wanted to be a cowboy. The cowboy hats were thrown out. The sheriff's badges were in the trash can. And hell, we were going to be astronauts. Well, Toy Story was written for me and mm-hmm. my generation. To, um, and yet it's also the beauty that it tells, that Pixar tells stories at two levels, one for adults and one for children. But so now think back to when you were a little girl and you were in your bed at night. You were very young. Did you have a monster in the closet or under the bed? Oh, yeah, for sure. Right. So clearly Monsters Incorporated was written (laughs) for you. Um, If you've seen the film Inside Out, are you familiar with Inside Out? Of course. I'm familiar with everything Disney. It's incredible. So it's a a story about a a girl, a teenage girl whose parents are moving and how she, her brain is in fact controlled by four little people who live inside her brain. Four emotions. There is joy, there's anger, there is disgust, and there is what would go on? Did it fear? I can't remember that. Anyway, <laughs> yes. so here's the thing. Here I am in Fort Myers. It's sunny. It's Florida. Everywhere else it's cold. I'm full of joy. And yet somebody suddenly cuts you up in the car and like, you bastard. And so they just you <laughs> instantly switch from joy to anger in that total second. Yeah. Or somebody next to me on the plane will bring on their cold pizza that they've had in their fridge for five days. And suddenly I will be full of disgust. <laughs> and so clearly that film was written for me. It's about, it's not just about the ability to tell a story. It's about the ability to tap into a core consumer truth. Children are brilliant at getting to a core consumer truth. So do you have children? Yes, you three. You sound quite young, but do you have children? Okay. I do. Yes, a, fi- a five-year-old, a three-year-old, a one-year-old. Oh, 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 this is perfect. Okay, so what's the first, so what question do they ask you? Um, can we become Lightning McQueen? <laughs> okay, so they're very curious, very yes. curious. If they were, if, think of that one-word question that they constantly challenge you with. What why? Is yes, and the one after that? Why? And the one after that? Why? <laughs> yes. And the one after that? Why? That was a trick question. <laughs> Yeah, so children lie. They know you've lied on the first answer. Uh, and so they are <laughs> seeking the core consumer. No, it's true. Yes, and so yeah. they're seeking what I call the core consumer truth. So they will push you and say, why, why, why? Because they are seeking the truth. We then go to school and we get a job and we're told there's only one right answer. So we stop asking the second why. But the fourth or fifth why may actually lead you to insights for innovation. So, for example, if you were to act childlike, not childish, and somebody said, well, why do you go to a Disney park? Uh, well, your data would tell you, or if you stopped at the first answer, they'd say, well, I go for the ride. Well, that mm. tells me that's a capital investment strategy. It could be a couple of hundred million dollars. I'll build a ride. I build rides, they will come. Why do we do that? It's always worked that way. It's worked that way since July 17th, 1955, when Walt opened the doors to Disneyland. But if you paused for a second and asked why again and said, what, why, 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 why the rides? Well, I, like, I actually I quite like Small World. Why on earth do you like Small World? Well, I remember the music. Why is that important to you? Well, I used to go with my mum. 
well, what, what, why is that important? Why take my daughter now? What that person has just told you on the fifth why is the real answer to why they're going to Disney. It has nothing to do with the capital investment strategy of $200 million and everything to do with her personal memory and nostalgia. That's a communication campaign, not a capital investment strategy. But we always stop at the first why. And yet the, uh, the, the, by digging deeper, as children do, you get by being curious. Um, people are not curious. And that curiosity, Albert Einstein once said, I'm not innately clever. I'm just particular. I'm just very curious. Uh, I'm going to cut. I will loop back to storytelling, I promise, because I love to go off <laughs> tangents. But curiosity, so, so metaphorically, you, I want you to put your hands up, but you'll have to tell me if you put your hand up. Um, do you, have you been or do you go to your favorite restaurant with your partner three or four times a year? And you look at the menu, you look at all the appetizers, the main courses, the desserts, at the same time as last year. You're listening to the specials, but not, you're, you're not really listening, are you? Because you're going to order the same thing you order every time. <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, hands up. Okay, so, okay, do you or do you not get in the same side of the bed every night? I do. And I just heard research that the majority of people do. <laughs> Even when you're in a hotel room by yourself? Yes, we do. Why? <laughs> so, <laughs> have you ever commuted home you go in a car a bus a trolley however you get home you look at the front door of your house or your apartment or the garage door and there's that split second where you think oh my god how did i get here yes where you sort of black out as right? you're moving through a habitual journey yeah here's what happened on the way home your brain physically shut down it got bored it knows where the florist is it knows where the supermarket is so it shut down no new stimulus in no fresh ideas out and people uh, tend to be happy. So my advice to them would be um, one day uh, a month. This is not a big ask. Starting in February, commute a different way to work on the way in, on the way back. One day a month, have a brown bag breakfast where you sit around from 9 till 10 a.m. on the first Friday every month and invite your team to come and talk about things they thought were innovative or creative in the last 30 days. No PowerPoint presentations. No, why is it good for the business? God knows they've got enough work to do. You'll be amazed <laughs> at the amount of ideas you can tie back to that breakfast. Um, the number one barrier to innovation in a survey of 5,000 cast members at Lucas, Films, Pixar, Marvel, Disney is I don't have time to think. Wow. And if you were to look at your diary, bring it up on your iPhone for tomorrow. I know what it looks like. It's, it's a presentation. It's a PowerPoint presentation. It's a meeting. It's scheduling. It's doing a, it's doing a talk. It's doing, and we hear ourselves say, oh, I don't have time to think. And when we don't have time to think, we can't come up with big ideas. And so, so what is it? You know, if I were to ask you some of the most innovative companies in the world, Google would be in your top 10. Well, what does, what's their secret sauce that they've got that you don't? Well, guess what? They have a company policy called 20% time. All of their engineers get 20% of their day time to think. In return, they've been given Gmail, Google Cox, Google Maps, uh, Google Maps, and self-driving cars. Um, playfulness. Another one that children are so good at, uh, and we're terrible at. And so people say, well, why should I be playful at work? Well, so let me ask you, close your eyes for me. I'm going to ask you a question. I, this is a word association game. I do not want you to think about the answer. Okay. I just want you to say the first word that comes into your mind when I ask you the following question, providing obviously it's something you can share in public. <laughs> okay, um, I'm ready. Where, where, where are you usually and what are you doing when you get your best ideas? Moving. I'm usually okay, so walking or, or talking yeah, to other people yeah. and my team. Sure. Yep, I did it with 350 people this morning. I got them all to write their answer down. You're going to hear shower, bathroom, <laughs> on the toilet, waking up, falling asleep, commuting, driving, gardening, right. walking the dog, jogging. Not one of them wrote down the following two words, at work. Well, that's a bummer, isn't it? Because you're paid to have big ideas at work. And now, picture the last verbal argument you have with some. Mm-hmm. Nice with yourself as you can. Get really picture it. You don't have to tell anybody about it. Just tell me when you can see it. Um, okay, I can see it. Okay, so you can open your eyes. The argument's over. You're angry at Fred. You storm out of the office. You're so angry at Fred. And you go across to your local coffee shop. You Perhaps you get a cappuccino. You sit down. It's five or ten minutes after the argument's over now. What just popped into your head? The perfect, the 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 perfect thing I yes. should have said in the middle of the heat of the argument. <laughs> The killer one line, the one line you wished you'd use, hell yeah. Oh, yeah, if I'd have said that, he'd have gone down. Oh, I'd have had a, oh, the perfect <laughs> line. Um, have you ever come up with the perfect line during the argument? Well, no. It takes that, that beat no. that beat of reflection. Right. My, yeah. my, my wife can. It's quite soul-destroying. But for <laughs> most people, it, <laughs> it, it's, it's five or ten minutes later. Why? Well, because here's how your brain works. 
Most of us live in what I call busy beta during the day. The door, or otherwise known as the reticular activating system, between your conscious and subconscious brain is firmly closed. That's not good because 87% of the capacity of your brain is subconscious. Every bicycle ride you've ever been on, every meal you've ever eaten, on innovation challenge you've worked on, industry you've ever worked in, every person you've ever kissed, even the ones you choose to forget that freak you out on Facebook 10 years later and want to be your friends again. Um, it's all back there as unrelated stimulus, but you can't access it when the door between your conscious and subconscious brain is closed. However, by being playful, and I run these things called energizers, they're just one or two minute exercises. All I'm doing is listening for laughter. The moment I hear laughter, I know I've opened the door between your conscious and subconscious brain and metaphorically placed you back in the shower. Or just, it, And the moment you give yourself time to think, you have the shower, you walk the dog, you step away from the argument, you come up with a big idea or the killer one-liner, but we don't give ourselves time to think and we're not playful. Uh, and so playfulness at the right time can be really helpful in innovation. And now I will actually come back and answer your question. Um, storytelling and why is it useful? Um, I'll give you the perfect example. We uh, asked four architectural firms to come and pitch for a piece of business uh, for Downtown Disney. Downtown Disney was a retail dining and entertainment complex at Walt Disney World Resorts in Florida. And um, the winning bid, obviously, was going to win quite a lot of money. That's putting it modestly. Um, and so the first three firms that came in, I couldn't tell you the amount of money they spent on their presentation. I know it was close to a quarter of a million dollars. Well, that's a lot of money to spend on the presentation. They had created architectural renditions and full models of the future of what this retail dining and entertainment complex could look like the size of a ballroom right down to a little holographic old lady waving out of a window. They blew my mind. And they were very slick. And then we went to the fourth presentation and we walked into the room and there was nothing there. Just a little old man in a rocking chair, but like Santa Claus, 12 rocking chairs in a circle. He said, come on in. Sit down. Close your eyes. Actually, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for just a moment. Can you close your eyes for me? I'm there. I'd like to tell you about a place called Disney Springs. Built on a natural spring in central Florida was a small town where a young man called Walt Disney, who was an animator at the Kansas City Star newspaper, met a young girl called Lillian. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course you can see it, because I asked you to close your eyes. <laughs> so your imagination will take you wherever in the story you choose to go. That's why books, whenever you see a Harry Potter book and a Harry Potter movie, everybody goes, oh, the books are always better. Well, were they better? <laughs> well, of course, that, but because your imagination took you to what Hogwarts looked like, took you to what mm -hmm. Harry Potter looks like. Which concept did we go with? We went with his. By the way, we were crying by the time he finished telling his story. Wow. But the power of storytelling, he knew his audience. We were storytellers. But he got us to close our eyes and got, took us to a place that we couldn't have got to otherwise. That is the power of storytelling. You also think about Walt. When Walt sold the concept of Disney, everybody thinks, oh, Disneyland, you know, he had so much money. No, Walt was bankrupt in 1940. Walt was genius. He had a film called Fantasia, which told a story through music. Um, but he wanted it to read the mist in the theater during Drip, 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 Little Abraham Hours. He wanted heat pumped in during Night on a Bear Mountain. And the theater owner said, no, Walt, too expensive. And Walt listed the rules. He calls it the what if tool. Uh, uh, the rules of going to a theater is dark, it's dirty, I must go at a set time. I, Walt, can't control the environment. And he said, well, what if I could? That's not provocative enough. The more provocative your what-if question, the further out of your river of thinking, your expertise, you will get. And he said, well, what if I take my movies out of the theater? What if I take them out of the theater? They can't be two-dimensional because they fall over. Or what if I made them three-dimensional? What if I made them three-dimensional? I'd have to have people play the characters. Well, if I had people play the characters, Cinderella couldn't live next to Jack Sparrow or Davy Crockett because people wouldn't be immersed in her story. Or what if I create a different land? Oh, wait a minute. I'll call it Disneyland. Mm. and when he went to Bank of America because he was bankrupt after Fantasia because it was a financial flop uh, um, and uh, he pitched what, what, and Disney and Pixar today all present their ideas through storyboards now let me tell you why I'm going to ask you a question how many days are there in September? Uh, 30 30 how did you know? Somewhere deep in my subconscious, I went back to grade school, I think, in that the second. <laughs> good, good. So keep your, eyes, keep your eyes closed. How did you learn it? 30 days past September, April, Bingo. June, and November. Bingo. Bingo. 
Right. You're an auditory learner. I'll say that you were at kindergarten five years ago. We'll give you the benefit of the doubt. It might have been a few more years. But instantly when I asked you the question, how many days there were in September, you went to the rhyme because you learn by listening. Mm -hmm. Now, there are other people in your class, and you may have noticed, I actually asked your children tonight, I bet you at least one of your child will put their fists together and start counting their knuckles. And they'll go January, February, March, April, May. Each knuckle has a 31. Each dip has 30. Um, What does that tell me? That tells me that that person's a kinesthetic learner Mm. because they learned that in kindergarten. But when I ask them the question, now, the other people, here's the other people. And they are usually the dominant force in the room. They'll say, oh, I just closed my eyes and saw a picture on the calendar. They're your visual learners. Mm -hmm. They dominate most audiences. When you're telling stories, when you're pitching ideas, it is important to remember that um, two thirds of your audience do not share your preferred learning style. Therefore, you want to make your presentations kinesthetic. You want to, obviously, you're going to talk visuals, very strong. So, for example, if the first slide in your PowerPoint deck says the word data. I am dead. I don't even care what's on slide two. I'm just not going to pay attention. Why? I'm a visual learner. I need pretty pictures. Mm. I don't care how compelling your data is. I'm, I'm, I'm gone. And so imagery and storyboards So uh, Pixar does it extremely well. They have something called a plussing meeting when they're pitching new storyboards at Pixar. What do you think they do in a plussing meeting at Pixar if you were to hazard a guess? You know, I've read a little bit about this, and the way I understand it is I I read this in a recent Harvard Business Review article, and they mentioned that practice. I believe that it's um, adding to someone's idea Mm -hmm. and not immediately jumping to criticism, right? Exactly. Exactly. So exactly. Uh, And that's exactly what it is. You can't shoot the idea down. You just have to remind yourself, we're all reductionists. The older we get, the more experience and expertise we get, the more reasons we know why the new idea won't work. So we sort to know because. Yes. yes. Actually, I tell you what, let's try it. We'll try an exercise. Now, are you more familiar with Harry Potter or Star Wars? Uh, Harry Potter. Okay. I'm going to come at you with some ideas for a Harry Potter party. We've got $100,000. I want you to start each response to my ideas with no because and tell me why you think that's not a good idea. I love it. Let's so go. So let's say, oh, I know. Let's do a Harry Potter. We're going to do Hogwarts dining room, right? It's going to be long. We're going to have a sorting hat at the entrance. And all the good people get to go to the Gryffindor table and all the bad table get put in slowly. Oh, no. Well, you know, I I just think that's going to be, one, a logistical nightmare. I mean, there's going to be a long line going up to the sorting hat. And then won't it feel terrible to be in the bad group? And we could create some negative energy in the room. I I, don't know. Oh, okay. All right. So what if everybody was, in fact, Gryffindor? Well, no, that that wouldn't really make sense either, that, that there's no real element of surprise or excitement to that. Okay, so what if we did a magic potions room where everybody with Professor McGonagall could make their own alcoholic beverage? Look, I can't find a wrong wrong problem with that. <laughs> no, stay with me. Stay with me. No, because. Okay. No, no, because. no, because, I mean, we're, we're going to have drunk adults on our hands and children who wish they could drink the potion. They're going to get jealous. It, I, I don't think that'll create good good vibes. Okay. What about a Dumbledore smoothie? No, that's disgusting. I mean, how would you sort of work in the beard concept to that? I think people would just be grossed up. Okay. So pause for a second. Um, so it would, traditionally, that's what happens. Somebody yes. comes to us with a new idea and we start with no because, because we know the reasons why it won't work. And then if you ask, if you do this exercise with a group of people and you ask the person who was getting the no because, how was that exercise? They're going to say it stank. And I'm going to ask them, did the idea get bigger or smaller? And they're going to say smaller. So here's a different way of doing it when used at the right time that I think could change cultures. So we're going to stay on Harry Potter. We've still got $100,000 for tonight's party. I'm going to throw out the first idea. The first two words out of your mouth with each response must be yes and. All right. And then we'll build the idea together. Okay. All right. So we're going to have the Hogwarts Hotel. We're going to have a, we will have the sorting hat on the reception desk. And it gets to choose which house you get to stay in overnight at the party. Yes. And... How about we pick up on Bluetooth in order to ping guests to know which way to navigate inside the party? We could sort of have different rooms for each house. Ooh, yes, and the Uber Eats drivers could come in on broomsticks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we could kind of try to figure out a way to incorporate uh, some kind of jingle or sound upon delivery of the food, and it would be sort of themed by house. 
Oh, yes, and we could all have that. We could, through augmented reality, we could have those floating candles coming down from the ceiling. Oh, I love that. Yes, and once the floating candles activate, I think that would be a good signal for everyone to sort of leave their respective homes or corridors and come into the Great Hall. And, and that would be the moment of gathering and celebration. Perfect. So here's the thing. When you watch people do this exercise, you'll watch the energy room in the level go up 100%. You're going to hear laughter. You're going to hear most people discover their hands for the first time in the day. Then when you ask them to the idea get bigger or smaller, they'll all say bigger. Now, let me ask you a second question. By the time we finish that second exercise, whose idea was it? Everyone's. Ours. The moment you can transfer the power, do not underestimate the the power of two simple words from the world of improv called Yes Then to transfer the power of my idea to our idea. Yes. You know, the, it's such a powerful exercise and it relates back to what made the Disney Springs pitch so effective, which is I am turning over the power and making this moment an act of creation and collaboration together. You know, instead of just delivering on this formal sense of here's me alone as this solo garage guru genius innovator, it's it's more about what's possible when we engage one another. And if your storytelling techniques of pitching your prototype or pitching your big idea are only about you being a genius and, and the perfect delivery of that, that is far less impactful. There's, there's far less energy that can get created um, in, inside that conversation. The buy-in, I'm sure. Have you, so in terms of a question, you know, buy-in, how do you, what do you see as being uh, most effective for, uh -huh. for generating buy-in? I'll tell you the least effective. Um, so did you <laughs> used to watch American Idol? Sure. Okay. Randy, Paul, and Simon, what did they sit behind? A, a big desk with big rejection buttons. Yeah. Yep, yep, a table. And what was the role of Randy Paul and Simon? Well, one was the cheerleader, one was the nurturer, and one was the... The asshole. <laughs> <laughs> the asshole. <laughs> but they were judges. The moment you put somebody on the other side of a physical object to you, they will think reductionist. They will judge your work. You've stood at the front. You've got your PowerPoint presentation out. You're starting to click through. You're telling them that, that it could be a client. It could be a boss. They've got more experience than you. They've got more expertise. They want to add value. You're telling them, I don't want you to add value. This is a finished deck. It's a big mistake to make. They will think reductionist. If you say... I'm scheduling a presentation for Tuesday. Huge mistake. They will automatically think reductionist and they haven't got in the room yet. Um, mm. When you get into the room and you've got the boardroom table, just ignore it. Take your presentation and stick it up on the wall all the way around the boardroom. Why? Well, because these people sat through 5,000 digital presentations last year, God knows they don't want to sit through another one. Um, but it also makes it visceral and real for the visual learners. But here's the more important part. Take your audience on a walk. Bring them out from behind the table and walk with them from one storyboard to the next and listen to their feedback. Instead of being a reductionist and shooting your ideas down, they will build on your work as you go. Because when you walk with someone, and this is the key point, the, you turn your presentation into a conference. And the ability to turn a presentation into a conversation, people will think expansively with you. They will build on your work as you go. You may have to change the final recommendation as a result. Who cares? They just force into it. Also, be careful of your choice of words. If you say, what do you think? People have a really annoying habit of telling you. But what you've really just said, you've invited them to think reductionist. If you just rephrase your question and say, hey, could you help me think about this a different way? Could you help me build on this idea? They will think expansively. And you'd be amazed how much more approval that was again. <laughs> that, I think, it flips the boardroom on its head. It gives agency to the people who could be seen as passive listeners, who, of course, are not passive listeners because they're typically the decision makers. And it, it, it invites them into the conversation. What impact do you see that having on the speed of innovation and the morale of the innovator? Well, if, if the senior leadership team's first two words out of their mouth are no because, then the young people aren't coming in again. Here's the challenge, and it's a unique one because it hasn't happened before. We are at a, a tipping point, and it's a tipping point that scares people of my generation because for the last God knows how many decades, the senior person has more experience and imparts and, and makes the right decision and imparts their knowledge down to the junior person. Uh -uh, not any more people. Mm -hmm. Guess what? The, game's, the game is changing. Diversity is innovation. If somebody looks different to you, 
they think different to you and they mm-hmm. will help you think differently. So, and let me talk about uh, the importance of diversity and it could be age. And it's, a, you know, it's, it's, we have as much to learn for the younger generation today as they have to learn from us, if not more, but we're too arrogant and frightened to say it. And the, the old, you know, the, the organizations that are run by the old white guys who are more worried about their retirement pension and bonuses than they are about taking a risk, they're running the company. That's an issue. Um, but let me just, if you don't mind, harp on about diversity for just a moment. Because Please, Because people yes. don't understand the power of it's diversity. It's critical. Um, we, we put people in cupboards and we say, oh, you're African-American. Oh, you should work on the African-American. Oh, I'm sorry, you're Hispanic. Oh, look, here's the Hispanic business. Well, that means then I should, I should solely work on the old white man business. And that's absurd too. Um, however, do you have a pen and a piece of paper to hand? Yes, I do. You told me to bring a Sharpie, a notepad, and a good sense oh, of humor. Good. So I'm prepared. Outstanding. <laughs> Outstanding. So we were tasked with um, creating a new retail dining and entertainment complex in Hong Kong Disneyland. I had in the room 12 white male American architects over 50. That's called groupthink. I invited into the room as my naive expert a young Chinese chef. What is a naive expert and how can they help you innovate? A naive expert is somebody who doesn't work for you and doesn't work in your industry. What does that give them permission to do that you can't? They won't solve the challenge for you. That is an unrealistic expectation. They can ask the silly question that you're too embarrassed to ask in front of your peers. They can also throw out the audacious idea ungoverned by your politics, your turf, your hierarchy, and your approval processes. Uh, And one of the questions or one of the silly things they'll throw out will get you out of your river of thinking. And it works every single time. So we were designing a new retail dining and entertainment complex, and I asked the architects to draw the following object. I'm going to ask you to draw it now, and I'm going to give you seven seconds to draw it. Please, are you ready? Okay. Okay, no pressure here. I would like you, please, to draw a house. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ten down. All right. So... Yes or no? Did you draw the door in the middle of the front? Yes. Did you draw two windows and are you still so insecure you drew bars over them? <laughs> I didn't get to the bars, but yeah, it looks okay, like a little right, face okay. with eyes and a mouth. Okay. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to go out on a wing and suggest to you that the roof just might be a triangle. Yes, indeed it is. Shocker. <laughs> 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 Why? Because because you're ri- so I gave the architects the same amount of time as you, and they all drew what you did. Why? Because their river of thinking, their air, their expertise, and their experiences told them that's what a house should look like. Well, at the same time, the young Chinese female chef drew dim sum architecture, which if you'd never seen it before, was hysterical. It was a round bamboo dish with a prawn ball, a pork ball, and a little Chinese lady dim sum waving out the window. Everybody laughed when we picked up our pictures because we realized we'd all seen in our river of thinking what a house should look like. She gave us permission to get out of our river of thinking and think differently. Yes. And to consider audacious architecture. If any company in the world could consider audacious architecture, it would be the Walt Disney Company. On the way out the door, somebody happened to just stick a post-it note over her dim sum architecture drawing, and it said this, distinctly Disney, authentically Chinese. Seven years later, the strategic brand position for the Shanghai Disney Resort Distinctly Disney, authentically Chinese. Wow. The naive expert will not solve the challenge for you. Their role is to say something or ask a question that you wouldn't, that you're too embarrassed about, to stop you thinking the way you always do and to help you think differently. One of the most genius tools to help us stop thinking differently is this. So, um, uh, got a pen and paper? I do. Excellent. You and I are going to go into business. Where do you live? Uh, Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Oh, God, I'm flying to Cincinnati today. I've never been. What? I know nothing about Cincinnati. No, <laughs> you I'm could have flying. come to I'm the studio. I'm Are you just crossing through? Fort Myers to Cincinnati. I'm doing a workshop there for a company. I can't remember the name. Actually. But uh, anyway, looking forward to it. Although, uh, you know, here I am in a T-shirt. I bet I won't be in one when I get off the plane. Um, it's I cold, but it's not um, miserable. So it's, and uh, if you okay. have time, I would love to meet you. <laughs> oh, okay. Coffee. That's right, amazing. So, um Duncan's gone off script again. Where was it? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> I was going to um, draw something. You and I are going to go to, we're going to go into business in Cincinnati. You're going to write this time. Um, I want you, we're going to go into business and you and I are going to open a car wash. I would like you to write down four essential ingredients that you know we should put in that car wash. All right. Do you want me to say them out yeah. loud or can I just write them? Sure. Yeah. Just say them as you write them. Okay. Soap, uh, scrub yep. brushes, friendly. Yep. Friendly folks. 
Okay. <laughs> this is in list of priority. Uh, and obviously water. Okay, great. Now, um, I'd like you to write down, uh, we're going, we're, screw that idea. You and I are going to go into business together and we're going to open an auto bar. <laughs> now, mm-hmm. what what could we put in our bar? Music, ambiance, coffee, ambiance, what else? Tea, right? A uh, barista. Okay, so here's the thing: in less than ten seconds, I took you out of your river of thinking, thinking as you always do about a mm. car wash, water, soap, brushes, vacuum, wah wah, and got you to consider what we could put in an auto spa, masseuse, barista. Et Which one would you rather visit, by the way? Oh, definitely the second. Right. So yeah, here's the thing. Yeah. All I did was stop you thinking as you always did. Walt was the genius. With three weeks to go to the opening of Disneyland, the landscape artists came to Walt. Notice I said landscape artists. I did not say gardener. And mm-hmm. they said, Walt, well, we're out of time, money, and resources, and two-thirds of our flower beds are full of weeds. What should we do? And he said, well, let's go for a walk. So they did. And he said, well, tell me the name of that weed in Latin. They're like, I don't know. He said, well, look it up. And they said, why? He says, I want you to tag each weed with a piece of card and a piece of string and put its Latin name on the card. And they said, why? He said, oh, that's easy because our guests will think they're exotic plants. (laughs) And so on July the 17th, 1955 at 9.01 a.m., look it up on Wikipedia, Disneyland opened its doors to the public with two thirds of its flower beds full of exotic plants yet to grow into fruition. No now, that's way. A funny, yeah, it's true. <laughs> but that's, that's a funny story, but, but, but it doesn't count. With one simple re-expression of a challenge, Walt created a level of hospitality and guest service that has never been replicated or duplicated despite many attempts to follow. Walt said, we will not have any customers in our park. We will only have guests. And with mm. that one simple re-expression, think about where you're treated when you're treated as a customer and think about crossing the threshold of your best friend's apartment or visiting a Disney theme park yes. and how you're treated. Not only that, he said, we will not have any employees. We will only have cast members. They mm-hmm. will be cast for a role in the show. They will wear a costume, not a uniform. They will work on stage or backstage. And you may think that's not important. Well, guess what? It bloody is. I worked there for 30 years and I couldn't be more proud. And I protected what See the same as everybody else did. Why? I'm a Disney cast member, and mm-hmm. I'm proud of being a Disney cast member. Yes. And later, I started my very first job, believe it or not, where I was a barman in the Rose and Crown pub at Epcot. Um, and that <laughs> same day, another gentleman joined the company. His name's Hector Rodriguez. He's from Puerto Rico. He's now 53. He's a jolly, rotund fellow. And he's still driving the boat backwards and forwards across the lagoon in Epcot 32 years later. Wow. And you might think that's a, you might think that's a mind numbing job. Not to Hector, it's not. On the odd occasion he comes to the house, he comes bursting through the door, big smile on his face, first words out of his mouth, you should see what I did for that guest today. Massive smile on his face, and he'll tell you with enormous pride about the smallest thing he did for a guest. Why did he do it? He's a Disney cast member. Now, hold on to that because people will think, Oh, this is too theoretical, how can I apply this to my business? In 2011, if we said, how might we make more money, which is the question everybody asks themselves every day. By the way, if you continue to ask yourself that question, Generation Z will put you out of business. Yes. And I'll come back to purpose and innovation in just a minute. Yeah. However, um, instead of saying, how might we make more money, we said, how might we solve the biggest consumer pain points? Now, have you been to a Disney park? Oh, yeah. Okay. What's the biggest pain point? Lines. Of course, Right. Lines. Nobody wants to stand in line. Yeah. So we said, we didn't know the answer. We used the tool that Walt used to use. What if? What if there were no lines? We didn't know how to solve for that. If you know how to solve for it, it's iteration, not innovation. So we said, what if we eliminated the front desk in our 27 hotels and you didn't have to check in? Mm-hmm. Didn't know how to do it. What if we eliminated the turnstile at the front of the four parks in Florida where you didn't wait 20 minutes to get in the entrance? What if you didn't stand in line for your favorite character meet and greet or favorite uh, attraction what if you didn't stand in line to pay for merchandise or food well we looked around the world and guess what rfid technology had existed five years before we invested in it now when you come to the walt disney world resort on holiday and stay in a walt disney world resort hotel you get a disney magic band in the mail what is it a small plastic band that sits on your wrist with rfid enabled it is your room key you don't wait to check in. It is your theme park ticket. There's no turnstiles at the entrance of the four parks anymore. You just swipe and go. Your favorite character meet and greets or rides, they're reserved. They're on your RFID-enabled Disney Magic Band. You swipe and go. I want an item of merchandise sent to my hotel. I'll touch it once. I want it sent to my house. I'll touch it twice. Think of the per caps on that little sucker. Now, there are security <laughs> features in place to stop children going around touching everything. 
<laughs> you know, it's truly incredible too. I think you know you've the the parks are taking it so far beyond accessibility and movement. Now, I, let me give you a quick example. I was there a couple of months ago with my five year old daughter. We got our fast pass. We tapped into um, Expedition Everest in Animal Kingdom, and we turned a corner through the queue, sure. and there's a digital screen with a Yeti holding a sign that says "Welcome Clara." To her first time on that roller coaster. So personalization too. I'm so excited and impressed for how the, these technologies are getting leveraged in the parks. Yeah, and not only that, I mean, here's the thing. The average guest now has between 90 and, two, and 120 minutes free time a day that they didn't have four years ago. And what has that resulted in? Record revenues. Record revenues on merchandise, record revenues on food and beverage, and 25 million visits a year live crowdsourcing the future design of every product and service Disney creates because you're telling us every second of every day what you like and what mm-hmm. you don't. Absolutely. So data is going to play an incredible role. You know, how do you think? Um, uh, yeah, t- uh, tell me more uh, about that. Data. So you cannot solely rely on it. So, so we had a project. We were asked to go and make more money for Disneyland Paris. How might we get more people to come more often and spend more money? Our data told us who could afford a visit to Disneyland Paris, who had an affinity to the brand, who'd been shopping online, and who was a 10 out of 10 of I'm coming this year for the last five years. Guess what? They hadn't come. So our data was clearly missing Mm. something. So I said, I put it to you that these people are either procrastinators or liars. Which is it? Let's go find out. (laughs) So we went to live with 26 consumers for a day. Now, you're a young mum, but let's see. Close your eyes. There's a photograph of your children somewhere in your house in a particular room. Mm -hmm. I want you to think about that photograph for just a second. And I want you to tell us which room it's in. It's above my fireplace in our living room. Okay. Okay. And is it on the mantelpiece Mm -hmm. or is it on the Yeah, on the mantel. Okay. Is it in a frame? Yes. What does the frame look like? Um, It's actually a canvas wrap. It's a little, you know, five inches by three inches. Okay. And tell us who's in the photograph, please. Well, it's my tiniest one, Emma. She's one years old. She's got her hands up really high, and it's her first birthday. And uh, my five-year-old Clara is kind of being a ham next to her, and Bryce is uh, looking lovingly towards the camera. Okay. And tell me me how old they were in that picture, please. Five, three, and one. And And how old are they today? The same. That was just a few months ago. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so because you're a young Indeed. mom, but so because, but but here's what we found in the vast majority of households we went into, and um, that when we asked how old the children were in the photograph, um, I was in a house. I said, "How old are your children? Love four or five? She goes, "No, love, they're fourteen or fifteen. Mm. I said, oh, okay. You write it down. It's one individual clue. How do we know that to be true? Um, because in the vast majority of houses, we all have that picture of our children that's anywhere from five to twenty years old. And for you, a young mum, I guarantee you that if I walked into the living room of your parents, they still have that really dorky, awkward one of you on your <laughs> high school graduation on their wall that you wish they got rid of years ago. How do I know that to be true? Because we all do. So we thought, hmm, this is weird. Do we not print new pictures of our children anymore? No, we do. So we thought there's something here our data's missing. Let's go and dig a little deeper. So we went and spent time with five of the mums. And here's what we found. We want our children... Uh, a first pass, if you ask parents what they want for their children, they will tell you we want them to go to kindergarten, junior school, middle school, high school, graduate, and be happy, healthy, and successful. That's what we want for our kids. No, you don't. You're lying. Um, Here's what we actually want them to be back in that little photo frame when we walk in the door at night. You're still too young. Um, but we, it goes. So I already fast. anticipate this. So no, I, I already so, have so, those fantasies of so. walking back into the little pr- playroom that we have yeah. in the house and wishing that she was, you know, toddling around. Yeah. Why do we love our grandchildren so much? Because they're right back in the frame. Yeah. And when we walk in the door, we are. It's right now when you walk in the house, you are Wonder Woman, and they come and they grab your legs. Everybody giggles. Somebody falls over. Somebody farts, and all of you <laughs> loses it in giggles. Um, these, these are the best times of yeah. your life. And yet, when I walk in the door now, I am lucky it's a dog. <laughs> and so we thought, hmm, there's something yeah. here. Let's push a little deeper. And so we pushed a bit deeper, and here's what we found. There are three bittersweet transitions that take place between the parent and the child. And I'm sorry for telling you these three because I'm about to break your heart. Um, but once you cross through that transition, 
You can't go back. You both want to go back, but you can't. It's too late. Now, going in, our hypotheses and our data told us if we build it, they will come. Why? Because we always do it that way. That's the way we do it here. But here's what we found. Again, the parents will tell you about these three bittersweet transitions that take place between a parent, sorry, it's going to get noisy for a second, and a child, I've arrived at the airport, I'm coming to Cincinnati, <laughs> and a child. And as you cross through that transition, you both instantly want to step back, but you can't. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, but I've got intuition, I'm a dad, and so here's the stories the mums are telling me, but I'll tell you mine. I know exactly where I was that day. It was Christmas Eve. I was with my son, he was 10. Uh, and he came around the door. He was wearing a navy blue shirt, little brown shorts. And his eyes, as your children do too, they come at you. Their eyes are half full of tears. They're bubbling up. They're just about to cry. And he pointed at me. He goes, Papa. I said, what? He goes, are you Santa Claus? Um, and it felt like a bullet in my mm-hmm. chest. I wasn't prepared for it. And I was about to lie. And he said, Mommy said, you are. And in that one split second, we both knew imagination, creativity, Batman was a lie, Spider-Man was a lie, Santa Claus was a lie, and imagination, creativity had just vanished. But what hurt so much was what he had really said was, Daddy, I'm not your little boy anymore. I'm growing Mm -hmm. up. And that hurt like Mm. hell. Now, now you're a girl, so you will not remember where you were that fateful day. (laughs) But when you get off this call, do me a favor. Call your dad and ask I him, will. and he'll answer you in point two. He will answer you in point two of a second, with incredible accuracy. But you don't even remember it happened. I know where I was, and I still get upset yeah. about it. I was outside Panera in Kissimmee, Florida. It was a Tuesday morning. It was about ten thirty, and she was thirteen. And she, the day she dropped my left hand in public for the Aww. first time, because she didn't want to hold daddy's hand in public yeah. anymore, and it hurt yeah. like shit. And you won't remember it, but you get you answer your dad when you get off this call, and he will tell you exactly yeah. where he was and which hand it was you mm-hmm. dropped because it's a seminal moment between a father and a daughter. And the last one, at least for us, was uh, we used to drive her to college and back, and you know you unpack a third of the room and you pack and you unpack and you pack. And um, this time around, though, she got her job, and we had to go to Manhattan, and uh, we had to drive her. Uh, we we flew her up to Manhattan. We drove up all her furniture. And um, she's been gone a year. Do you know how many times I've walked into her bedroom? One. I can't walk into yeah. her bedroom. Yeah. I just can't. Um, and so um, we put her in her apartment. We packed her in. And uh, we cheered and we hugged. And then my wife and I got in an Uber and cried yeah, her eyes out. Always right. here. LaGuardia. Now, don't forget, our going, in, our going in hypotheses and our data told it, if we build it, they will come. But by getting out of your data... Because if you've got data, guess what? Your competition's also got it, right? So how will you find that insight for innovation? By looking somewhere where your competition isn't looking. I would argue by spending a day with your consumer, what we learned was mum does not wake up every morning worrying about whether or not Disneyland Paris is going to have a new product this year. She wakes up every morning, as you do, worried about how quickly her children are growing up and how she wants to make special memories for them while they still believe, while they still hold my hand, while they're still here. That is a communication campaign, not a capital investment strategy. One that did not drive intent to visit 20%, it drove sales 20% and turned a very product-centric, we build it, they will come, we know best culture into a consumer-centric culture where it is now mandatory for every Disney Park executive to spend two days a year working as a frontline cast member in the park and one day every two years in the in the living room of one of our consumers. Wow. So yes, data is mm-hmm. going to get better and better and better, but you cannot solely rely on it because intuition is remarkably powerful. And so I've covered curiosity, I've covered intuition. Just two other things, question. Um, when you were a little girl, you got the biggest Christmas present you ever got, uh, came in a huge box, took you ages to get the gift out of the box. What did you spend the rest of the day playing with? That toy, of course. Probably the box, actually, when I was little. The Depending box, on how the little. Box, the box. Yeah. Yes. No, it was the box. It was the box. And you played with that box for four or five days until it got a bit ratty and mummy threw it out and you cried. But until then, it was your castle, it was your rocket ship, and it was your fort. And then you go to school and the teacher tells you it's just mm-hmm. a box. And we are imagina- our creativity starts to collapse. I know you have an amazing imagination. I know you had that weird l- dream last week about David Beckham, Beyonce, and the unicorn. Um, we all have weird dreams that we don't want to talk about. But here's the thing. We were all born creative. You saw the castle in the box. 
We were all born with an amazing imagination. We were all born with intuition. You have 100 billion neurons in your brain. You have 100 million neurons in your stomach. It's called your second brain. Every decision you make, what the clothes that you're wearing right now, what you eat for lunch, every product and service you choose to engage with, you, I went with my gut. And we were all born curious. We used to ask why, why, and why again. And then we were told to shut up. Now, guess what? And I've spoken to three AI experts, and I've asked them, do you, sir, we talked about the editor of Wired magazine stood up at Oracle World in San Francisco in October just before me and said he believes 20% of the jobs in North America will be gone by 2030. Well, that's civil unrest time. Gone to artificial intelligence. So I started to ask the AI experts. I said, do you believe we can program creativity? They said, no. I said, do you think we can program intuition? They said, no. So the things you were born with, the four core traits you or we all have, curiosity, imagination, intuition, and creativity. You can't program them. Or will you be able to 15 years from now? Nobody knows. Will you be able to in the next 10? Hell no. So the most employable skill sets are the ones you've been told to That's ignore right. for the last 20 That's years. Right. And as you seek to employ other people, because, you simply, because they can't be programmed. That's right. Oh, my goodness. Duncan, I am so grateful for all of the insight that you've shared. Uh, I, I know the innovation community and the listeners are going to just uh, have so many uh, ideas that kind of come from every strategy and every anecdote that you've shared. I want to ask you one more question. Why did you, this, is, this might seem irrelevant, but I promised my three-year-old son that I would ask you, why did you launch Buzz Lightyear into space? Ah, because it was impossible. <laughs> because it was Im we were opening we were opening Toy Story, and um, now you've seen Toy Story. What was Buzz Lightyear's dream? To to to, to kill the evil Emperor Zurg and, and bring ba back universal peace. Yes, that's fair. But Buzz wanted to fly. Oh, the well, yes, on the yes, at a functional level, sure. Buzz couldn't. <laughs> Buzz, no, hang on. This I mean, I'm talking about Buzz's Buzz, like real Buzz. deep dreams, but yeah, yeah, you're right, right. You're right. No, 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 come on. So, Buzz dreamt of flying, but he couldn't. And I said, well, what if oh. I can make Buzz like his dreams come true? <laughs> and people said, well, how are you going to do that? I said, I'm going to send him into space. So I went up to pitch NASA on the idea of taking Buzz Lightyear into space on a space shuttle. And, um, you could tell that half the room loved the idea, and uh, but nobody was going to stick their neck out and say so, and half the room wanted to throw me out through the window without opening it. So um, they agreed. And six months later, I got a call from Johnson Space Center in Texas, and they said, hey, we need Buzz Lightyear here tomorrow by 4 uh, o'clock. I was like, because? I said, launch isn't for six months. He said, if you can't get him here, the deal's off. I was like, what the hell? I said, well, why? Just out of curiosity. He said, well, actually, we need two Buzz Lightyear's here tomorrow by five or four o'clock, and they need to be identical. I was like, because? And he said, well, um, we're going to take one Buzz Lightyear apart pretty much atom by atom, because if we find a molecule of um, an air pocket inside his plastic, that could explode in the vacuum of space and kill one of our astronauts. And I was like, oh, yeah, totally. I knew that. Of course, that's what I would have done. But Seems then, important. Here's the irony. This was a theme park ride, not a movie. We didn't have merchandise out when we had theme park rides. Only the movies get new merchandise. So I had 37 people. This, this is getting sillier and sillier. I had 37 people in Walmart, Kmart, Target, Disney stores, trying to find Buzz Lightyear. I was like, oh, my God, don't tell me this deal's going down because the Walt Disney Company can't find Buzz. <laughs> so we found one. We're in a total panic. It's now 4 o'clock in the afternoon. This was 2005. Smartphones did not exist. I was still on my Motorola Flip, and I got a phone call. Couldn't see who it was from. I'm in my car in a panic trying to find Buzz Lightyear because the FedEx deadline's coming up. And all I hear on the end of the phone is, to infinity, I'm beyond. I was like, who the hell is that? And it, it was my wife. She goes, it's me. It's me, dear. I said, well, where did you find him? She goes, oh, it's been underneath James's bed. He's been dust for about five years. I said, oh, bring it over. Get it, get it over, get it over. So I wrote, so just as Andy wrote his name on Woody's foot, I wrote James on Buzz's foot. Stop and I sent the two buzzes off the NASA and said, look, don't destroy this buzz. This is a real little boy's buzz like you. Take this one into space. So six months later, we went to the launch. And let me tell you, I was pathetically emotional. Oh, I can't even imagine. <laughs> was James there? I'm sending my buzz. Yo, oh, yes, he was. Um, I, got, I started crying. It's like, we are sending Buzz Lightyear into space. And so off goes Buzz Lightyear. And so we brought Woody down to wave goodbye. And anyway, so off goes Buzz. And then we start to see these amazing images that NASA shot. You can look them up on oh, YouTube. Yeah. Just type Buzz Lightyear in space. 
Actually, if you've got Toy Story 3 in the preview, Buzz, the cartoon character, shows you exactly what he did in space. Um, and there's amazing images of Buzz right here flying in zero gravity. And it's just like... It, it, <laughs> anyway, so then, right... So then we're opening another Toy Story attraction. I thought, how the hell am I going to top sending Buzz like Yeah, that's a pinnacle. I thought, I know. I'm going I'm to bring him home. <laughs> and people are like, okay. So I phoned NASA, my mate, and I said, hey, when are you, uh, when are you bringing Buzz back then? And all you heard was total silence on the other end of the phone. <laughs> he says, well, that was never part of the contract. It was never part of the deal. To which my tongue was firmly in my cheek when I said the following words. Well, no man left behind, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, you bring everything back, right? He said, no, you don't. I said, well, what the hell do you do with it? He said, well, we just open the hatch and push it out. Uh, I was like, oh. No! See, I said, you can't, in exactly, I said, you can't incinerate Buzz Lightyear in the Earth's atmosphere. I'll leak it to the world's press at NASA. <laughs> and my tongue was so far in my cheek. Anyway, God bless NASA. They agreed to bring Buzz. Incredible. Home. Now, so we, we went out to the landing site. The weather was miserable. So uh, you're probably too young, but it's um, these wonderful images. When the space shuttle couldn't land in Florida, it went over to the Edwards Air Force Base in the desert in California. And you would see this amazing image of a space shuttle sitting on the back of a 747 jumbo jet, being piggybacking its way back across the country. I mean, j just stunning, this technology. Anyway... <laughs> I have, the pass I have the passenger manifest for that flight, the real passenger manifest. Seat 1A, Congressman, blah, blah, blah. Seat 1B, Senator, blah, blah, blah. Seat 1C, Mission Control, blah, blah, blah. Seat 14A, Astronaut, blah, blah, blah. Seat 15B. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. my little boy coming home, my little boy. And so, I, so uh, we talked to James, and because uh, we got a call from uh, the Smithsonian sitting there in Space Museum, and they said, "We want to play." <laughs> this is just getting darker. Oh, I tell you, the other thing we did, we created a nationwide schools competition because um, NASA, as you remember, you'll probably remember the Apollo 11 space patch. NASA does a space patch for every mission. So we asked the school children in the United States of America to create a space patch for Buzz's mission. We got thousands of entries. Um, NASA chose one. We turned it into a real, NASA created a real space patch and uh, we sent it off to space, <laughs> as one does. So when it went around, the, I mean, their space shuttle, by the way, goes around the planet Earth, uh, or used to, anyway, eight times a day. So they see eight sunrises a day. So this space patch had actually been into space with Buzz Lightyear. And so um, we talked to James. So I said, how do you feel about giving Buzz to the Air and Space Museum? And he was older by then. He said, no, I'd be delighted to. So when you go to the, uh, when you're next in Washington, D.C., I invite you to go to the Air and Space Museum. And you go into this particular, you'll have to ask. Uh, he's inside a locker inside the space shuttle. And uh, there in a little bronze plaque, it says, Buzz Lightyear, gift of James Ward. Oh, oh, my goodness. Duncan. So, in answer to your question, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot wait to tell Bryce. I am so grateful for all the creativity that you've inspired in our conversation. And I hope we just uh, continue to think beyond infinity. I know it's cheesy. So, when, it, when, is, when, is, when is Bryce's birthday? March. It's 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 coming up. Good. Send me your address. They didn't make one patch. No, they flew fifty, and I may have a few. You patch. are kidding me. He is going to melt. <laughs> no. And uh, now, on the spirit of to infinity and beyond, I am a great believer in Henry Ford's quote: "Whether or not you think you can or think you can't, you're probably right." I was told by uh, one of these recruitment consultants that I'd never worked for the Walt Disney Company. I was told that I'd never live in the United States of America. And when I phoned the Walt Disney Company in London every day for 27 days until they got so fed up of taking my call, I got an interview. Wow. And I became the cappuccino boy. <laughs> I was that boy. I was the cappuccino boy. And I was very proud of being the cappuccino boy. Um, never give up. Uh, Winston Churchill, keep buggering on. Or as I say, Henry Ford, whether or not you think you can or think you can't, you're probably right. The opposite of bravery is not cowardice, it's conformity. That's right. That's right. Duncan, I'm, I'm speechless. Thank you. That's all I got. I got to go. All right. Plane. I'll see you in Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> Later. Okay. <laughs> 
Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. Untold Content.